Polk County Fire Rescue provides advanced life support transport to all residents and visitors of Polk County. It also provides fire suppression, rescue services, and fire prevention services to all of unincorporated Polk County, as well as the municipalities of Eagle Lake, Polk City, Mulberry, Lake Hamilton, and Hillcrest Heights. Polk County Fire Rescue has nearly 600 full-time employees, responds to more than 90,000 calls for service each year, and covers a service area of more than 2,000 square miles. The paramedics of Polk County Fire Rescue have recently been tasked with some new duties as part of a new program called Helping Hands. Joining us today with more information on how Helping Hands program came about and how the Polk County Fire Rescue paramedics will be contributing to this program are Commissioner Bill Braswell and Fire Chief Tony Stravino. Welcome gentlemen, thank Thanks. you both for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So Helping Hands, how did this program come about? Okay, what, what the Sheriff's Office found out is that a lot of the uh, inmates in the jail system that have uh, abuse problems, either mental health abuse problems or substance abuse problems, tend to come back as repeat customers. And it's very costly in the jail system to house them a day, give them their medicine, give them their food. So in cooperation with Indigent Health and Polk County Fire Rescue, we identified this need and said, is there some way we could figure out a way to prevent these people from going back to jail and helping them become productive citizens? So over the last seven or eight months, we decided we were gonna start this program called Helping Hands with our community paramedics. Our community paramedics are a new initiative that the Board of County Commissioners authorized where we're trying to reduce the repeat customers in a various different levels and our first foray into this is with the mental health customer out of the jail. So what's going to happen is the uh, Sheriff's Office is going to identify inmates that they think would, would be practical for this program and we would introduce them to a community paramedic within 48 hours of their discharge. And that community paramedic would then go in, get, bring them their uh, prescribed drugs make sure that they understand how to use them, when to use them, simple things like that people take for granted that they don't really know. So we're gonna make sure that they do that. And then we're gonna do follow-up visits every 24 hours or so to make sure they're taking their meds. And a lot of them need help getting channeled into social services, <coughs> employment uh, recommendations. So we're gonna be like a information base for them as well besides the medical end of this where we can say, okay, we think you need some help finding some employment. So we're gonna turn you on to this job source or we're gonna turn you on to a mental health counselor to help you. Did you make your appointment? And we'll follow up and make sure they did make their appointment. And we think through this program that we'll be able to prevent them from going back into the jail, make them productive citizens, and help our residents. One of the biggest problems we have in, in Polk County Fire Rescue is our, our call volume is gonna break 100,000 calls this year, and a, lot of, a fair amount of those calls are not true emergencies in the emergent sense, but to the person who's calling it is an emergency. So what we're trying to do is figure out a way to help those people without them calling 911. Okay. Yeah, now, and, and, and it's important to note, you know, what the chief said, you know, it's a cost savings, but more important, it's getting these people back into a productive life. I mean, that's the real goal here, because if they're productive, they stay out of jail, they have a job, uh, they contribute to society, and that's, that's what we're really trying to do here. Now, are, if they qualify for this program, does this mean that primarily they're considered to be nonviolent? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. The sheriff has a, a very detailed uh, checklist that they'll go through. They're, they're not going to recommend every inmate that has mental health issues or, or, or on drugs, uh, mental health drugs. They're going to have to meet a very stringent requirement because we don't want to jeopardize our paramedic safety either because they're going out there and attempt to help people and we don't want to get into the violent patient routine. And will these paramedics be given any additional training? Yes, ma'am. They're going to get a lot of they're going to get a lot of mental health counseling training, which they're going through right now, and a lot of social services training as to far, as to far, what are the resources in Polk County, where what kind of resources they are, who are those contact people. It's all about relationships, so that we could take patient A and send them to the, with the appropriate care to make them productive. Nice. Well, Commissioner, where did the funding come from for this program? Well, when the citizens voted to extend the indigent care tax, that's where the money is coming from. And that, that's opened up a, a lot of opportunities for us because, you know, mental health, it's a huge issue right now. And, and it's usually way down the totem pole as far as funding goes. Um, I don't know the exact amount that Polk County brings in uh, through the uh, indigent health care tax annually, but I know it's enough to fund programs like these. And ultimately, what they do is they really save us money because if these people aren't in jail, like I said before, if they're out there uh, as a productive citizen, uh, they're off the taxpayer's back and, and they're out doing good for uh, themselves. 
There's another new initiative right now, Pulse Point. What is that? What is that about? Well, it's it's where basically it's it's uh, exists already in a lot of communities, and it's where you know you've been in a restaurant and you're sitting there, you're eating lunch or whatever, you see the ambulance pull up across the street and they run in and they help somebody. And maybe you're a doctor, maybe you're a nurse, maybe you're somebody who, who, who could have saved that person or certainly could have been there a lot quicker. It's basically an app that ties in with our 911 system. And when the call comes in, somebody's choking or somebody's having a heart attack or something like that, it alerts you. Now you have to be, will be vetted by you uh, through the uh, software program. Yeah, the, the people will be vetted to, to make sure they legitimately know what they're doing. But it would alert everybody uh, in that area that this is happening. And it may be at the table next to you or across the room or whatever, but it allows somebody who can save somebody's life to get there a lot quicker. Uh, the ambulance, it's going to be there in 6, 8, 10, 12 minutes, whatever it takes, depending on traffic and all that. But once they get there, they'll take over. But in the meantime, maybe somebody like a doctor could be helping you out. So the app is on the phone of the person who has the problem or no. someone who has the skill set the, to the, be able to The person to help with the skill set. They'll have, you know, once this program's rolled out, uh, there'll be, uh, I guess, an education process. We'll advise people about the app. They'll sign up. They'll get vetted. Uh, once they're in the system, their phone would go off and they would be notified of uh, the situation and then they would have the opportunity to help out. Okay. And this is going through the county's 911 system? Yes, ma'am. To reiterate what the commissioner just said, <clears throat> it's an application that will be on the county's 911 system. You'll register. If, you, if you're trained in CPR, you can register for this application. And then they'll vet you to make sure that your qualifications are correct. And then anytime there's a sudden cardiac arrest in a public environment, your phone, if you're within a quarter mile walking distance, your phone will go off with a special alert tone. And then if you choose to assist or not, you don't have to, nobody's gonna track that, but if you're close by and you're willing, it kind of engages civic engagement. There's a lot of people out there that have a lot of credentials that would be willing to help, they just don't know. So this is an application that the commissioner found and, and we agree it's a great idea to put it out there. It's a big county and like he said, we can't be everywhere and it takes us a little bit of time. So if that's your mom or your grandmom or your daughter having that problem, you want, if somebody's trained close by, we'd like to notify you and if you're willing to help, great. And it also provides the location of defibrillators, right? Automatic external defibrillators, which you don't need any training on. There's three steps right built onto the machine. It'll tell you where the closest one is. Huh. You can get it yourself or send somebody to get it and bring it to the sudden cardiac arrest patient and defibrillate before we even arrive and, and I continue think, CPR. And I think wow. with the app, if you have the app, if you're one of these people and you notice a defibrillator that's not uh, in the app, you can like take a picture of it That's and it'll pinpoint the location so that they can build a database of where the uh, defibrillators are. That's excellent. Yeah, it's kind of cool. We're excited about it. It's going to be a, 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 encourage civic engagement and really we believe it'll save a couple lives throughout the year for sure. The, the, heart, the thing to remember as a citizen is that your brain, your brain dead in five to six minutes. So unless that ambulance happens to be right around the corner, it, it, it's, it's in God's hands. Yeah. So if we can get a citizen there that can do some CPR, if you do effective CPR, there's a, there's a 40 to 50 percent chance by the time we get there that you, we can make a, a big save in your life and help your life. Wow. So it's very important for everybody to get CPR training whether they join this program or not. We encourage anybody and everybody from, from a 10 year old kid to a grandparent, go get CPR, protect your pools, no CPR, and, and join this Pulse app. Yeah, especially, especially important in the summer with everybody in the swimming pool and you know how that goes every year. Yeah. Now this required funding as well, I'm assuming. Yes, yes. Um, but believe it or not, uh, Pulse Point's cost is really inexpensive. It's, it's, it's really the cost of an app uh, and I don't know exactly how it ties into the 911 system, but the, the materials uh, were, were very inexpensive. And Excellent. I think it's a great program. And like the Chief said, if we save one, two, three lives a year, well, it's way well worth it. Yeah. Um, has the Pulse Point app been tested? Are other counties using it? How did you find out about this? Well, I actually, years ago, the, 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 I don't know if it's the same company, but the concept started in Europe. And I guess they don't have uh, the sophisticated uh, 911 systems we do. I don't know. But it started over in Europe, and I was watching the company. And when it got to the U.S., it, it kind of exploded. Uh, a lot of uh, large municipalities uh, adopted it. 
And I was just uh, uh, reading about it, and I thought, well, this is a great idea for Polk County. So I got to look, and I believe Osceola and Orange County already have it in place. Maybe down in South Florida, yes, sir. it's in place. Um, so, so it's being adopted, and I think it's probably catching on pretty quick. Well, that's excellent. Yeah. Gentlemen, thank you both for, for more information on some really great programs. Well, thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Helping Hands is an innovative and ambitious program designed both to serve some of Polk County's most vulnerable residents and to save taxpayer money by spending it in a wise and socially responsible way. Stay tuned. We'll be talking about the 2018 hurricane season with Paul Womble, the new Emergency Management Director, right after this. Up to 40% of businesses never recover after experiencing a major disaster. Make a plan at ready.gov slash business. Wait, wait. Thanks. Running late? Yeah, traffic is rough this morning. Crisis averted. Uh, no crisis, just a little traffic. What if there had been a lot of traffic? Everyone needs a backup plan. Just like every company needs a business continuity plan. What just happened? Could be a blackout. Completely unpredictable. Where did you get that? It's important to start your business continuity planning early. How long can you operate without core systems and processes? What if your entire network went down? No communications means no sales and lost customers. Why isn't this thing working? Finally. Recovery's good. But 75% of companies without continuity plans fail within three years. Who's in charge during a disaster? Hmm? Like a fire? Identifying teams and assigning tasks is essential. Everyone needs to know their responsibilities. What's going on? It could be a hurricane. Hurricane? Weather can badly damage your assets. Planning better prepares your company to recover from any disruption. Why are you getting wet? Not everyone's under the same umbrella. It's important to test, update, and exercise your preparedness method. So, can we share? No. A business continuity plan for one company won't fit another. That's why it's important for everyone to develop their own plans. Why are you wearing a mask? Don't forget to plan for the human element. Contingency planning should go beyond natural disasters. Plan for man-made threats too. Will your continuity plan be in place when it matters most? The U.S. Small Business Administration, or SBA, is dedicated to helping small business owners succeed. In the wake of a disaster, SBA provides low-interest disaster loans to homeowners, renters, businesses of all sizes, and private nonprofit organizations. These loans can help you recover from uninsured or underinsured disaster losses. Loans can be used to repair or replace real estate, personal property, machinery and equipment, inventory, furniture and fixtures, leasehold improvements, and other business assets. Some applicants may be eligible for additional funds for refinancing existing mortgages or mitigation projects to protect against future damage. SBA also offers working capital loans to small businesses that have suffered economic injury. Obtaining a disaster loan is a three-step process that involves your loan application, loan processing, and disbursement. To apply for assistance following a presidential disaster declaration, you must first register with the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA. 
In most cases, you will then be referred to SBA for possible loan assistance. Then, apply online, which is the fastest way to receive a decision about your loan eligibility. Or, apply in person at any disaster recovery center and receive personal one-on-one -on -one help. Call SBA's Customer Service Center at 1-800-659-2955 to locate the center nearest you. You can also submit a paper application by mail. In non-presidential disaster declarations, individual assistance from FEMA is not available, and you can contact SBA directly to apply. Next comes your loan processing. SBA will conduct a credit check before scheduling an on-site inspection to determine your total verified losses. A loan officer will work with you to approve or decline a loan. This may take up to three weeks. The final step is disbursement. Within five days of signing SBA's loan closing documents, your initial disbursement is made. A case manager will work with you to meet all your loan conditions and schedule the rest of your disbursements until you receive the full loan amount. For more information, visit sba.gov slash disaster and go to disasterloan.sba.gov slash ELA to apply online. If you've lived in Florida for at least a year, you know that it's hurricane season once again. Polk County's Emergency Management Division is responsible for planning and coordinating actions to prepare, respond, and recover from natural or man-made disasters. Joining the program today is Paul Womble, the director of the Polk County Emergency Management Division. Welcome to the program, Paul. Thank you. Now, I've lived in Polk County for many years now, and I wasn't aware of the Emergency Operations Center. Can you give us a, a brief outline of where it is and what its purpose is? Polk County EOC, we're located uh, in between Winter Haven and Lakeland on um, the public safety complex with the Sheriff's Office, Polk State College, their public safety training facility, the medical examiner's office, and county utilities. We really have two roles at the EOC. Um, our preparedness role is just that, to plan, train, exercise. It's really, we, our program is countywide, which means we work with all the cities, nonprofits, faith-based organizations, volunteer groups, uh, to train and just to make sure that Polk County as a whole is ready to go, that everybody knows each other, and that we're ready to work together. When we have a hurricane or any other emergency, the role of the EOC is primarily coordination. Uh, it's policy. We bring senior county leadership there, the Board of County Commissioners, our county manager's office, senior county staff. And the role of the EOC is to look countywide. Um, we coordinate the response. We can request resources from the state and the federal government. Our emergency management system in the country is starts all disasters are local. So we would start at the lowest level of response, which would be uh, at the cities, and then that works up to the county. So our role is really to work countywide, and then we're the ones that would go to the state, and then the state goes to the federal government for assistance. Now that's one of the interesting things. I, I was actually in the EOC during Irma, and I, I was fascinated by the fact that every agency had someone there. Right. We our. our our role is in emergency management is to coordinate the response. We have to bring in all the agencies, all the jurisdictions. Anybody that has a has a role in, a, in an emergency, and our job is to put it all together and make sure we're, you know, we're working together. We have one plan, you know, working for the same set of objectives. Um, so, you know, if you think about all the different things that have to happen in a hurricane, from sheltering to evacuations to security, you know, to fire rescue and, and search and rescue. Uh, restoration of utilities, all those things, you know, we have to bring in all those experts, all those functional area experts, and that's, again, that's the EOC serves as that, as that coordinating role, that one place where all those officials and agencies can come together to work together, you yeah. know, towards that emergency. Now, what are, the, what are some of the lessons that we learned from, from Irma, the most recent storm? Well, you know, before Irma, our benchmark really was, in Polk County, was the 2004 hurricane season with three storms that came through. Uh, even the EOC itself was an output of the 04 season. We, we were not in that facility. We had a very small facility at the oh. Bartow Air Base. And the plan before 04 had always been right out the storm at the Air Base in a room that had 28 seats, barely enough room for county staff and a couple of the outside agencies, certainly not enough room for recovery. And then if we were hit, we would go to the WH Stewart Center in South Bartow, which is what we did in 04, but that meant 
you know, there's no permanent facilities for the EOC itself. There was a phone system, one projector, and that was really about it. Facilities had to set that room up. Um, it was bare bones. It's a great big empty room. So we learned a lot from 04. So in Irma, you know, the EOC um, is structurally sound. You know, we, we're going to be in that facility in the middle of a hurricane, which we were. So the facility itself performed very well. So 04 was that benchmark before. Our biggest benchmark right now with Irma was our sheltering. You know, we opened 20 hurricane evacuation shelters, which was a record. Um, we sheltered over 10,000 people total. About 1,400 of those people were in our special needs shelters, which our special needs program is designed for people that have some type of life-saving equipment. Typically, it's plugs in, it's electrical dependent, or they're on oxygen. So we had almost 1,400 people in those three special needs shelters, which in 2004 was about a little over 700. So we almost doubled our shelter demand, our shelter occupancy in Irma. Hmm. Now, was this anticipated or something that it, we no, had to react to? It, it, was, it was not. Um, we have about 3,000 people in our special, special needs registry. I'm going to say that again. Okay. We have about 3,000 people in our special needs registry, which People can call our office, the emergency management office, and we really prefer that they pre-register. We know who they are, what their medical issues are, that way it helps us plan. So our percentage um, that we plan for is based off that number. Okay. So no, our benchmark had been about the 750 that we saw at any one time in the 2004 hurricane season. The demand for special needs in Irma was statewide. Every county reported a significant increase of last minute registrations, people that just showed up at the shelters. So really our lessons learned now is that our benchmark is about 1,400 people and all three of our special needs shelters were just about at capacity. So staffing was a challenge. Uh, the inbound phone calls, people wanting to register, people asking for information on the program. So we've done a lot of work with the Department of Health. Every county employee now has a disaster assignment, a disaster role. And part of that is, a big part of that program is to work in special needs shelter. So we're training those employees actually now. Uh, and we're also, we've formalized job descriptions. We made it a coordinated effort with the Department of Health. DOH provides the medical staff, the nursing, and then the mm -hmm. county provides support staff, logistical support staff and help. So we, it made sense to just do that staffing plan together. Okay, so lessons learned and, and we've already put things in place. Yes, That's definitely. That's fantastic. Now, if I'm a resident and I decide that I am going to hunker down at home, what are some of the things that you as the Director of Emergency Management would suggest to someone like that? Well, everyone should have a disaster plan for their home or business and it's based off of your situation. My disaster plan is based off of I'm going to be at work in a hurricane. So I have to make sure my home, my family, you know, my preparedness efforts um, take that into account. So everyone's plan should be different. If you have family members that rely, you know, they have medication, you should stock that up. If you have pets, you should plan for your pets. So everybody should have that plan. So our evacuations in Polk County are based primarily on wind. You hear a lot of preparedness in leading up into hurricane season from coastal counties with evacuation zones. We don't have evacuation zones in Polk County because we don't have a beach. So we get a lot of calls about that. We don't have those zones, but everyone should have a plan. Our evacuation policy in Polk County is not based off of storm surge like coastal counties. It's based off of wind. So if you live in a structure, you know, a a hardened home, you know, concrete block house, not an RV, not a mobile home. Our recommendation is you harden your house, shutters, uh, some type of window protection, and you do this, that, you hunker down there. Okay. Um, our evacuation policy does include RVs, manufactured homes, mobile homes, and areas that historically flood. If you know you get water up to your house in an afternoon thunderstorm where we get two or three inches of rain in a short amount of time, your plan should be to go somewhere else because if we have even in a tropical storm that could have 8, 10, 12 or more inches of rain in just a day, flooding is one of the reasons that we want people to have a place to go. So our shelter should be that last resort. Mm -hmm. um, you are going to be much more comfortable with people you know, whether it's family, people you work with, people from church, 
your sure. neighbors, et cetera, than to stay, in, to stay at home where it's not safe or to try to come to our shelters. But that's why they're there. You know, they are, uh, again, we, we sheltered a lot of people from out of the area. Mm -hmm. That was one of the things we saw in Irma. We opened two shelters at the request of the state to support people that were evacuating from South Florida. Okay. Now, it, it, uh, the EOC learned from, from, from Irma. What can, what can a member of the general public learn from Irma? What, what were some of the things that happened that probably shouldn't have happened, things we can prevent from happening again? Well, the thing that we, can, we can't prevent all of the impacts from a hurricane, the biggest impact we saw in Irma for, the, for, the, for our citizens and our visitors was power outage. Mm -hmm. One of the big differences between the 2004 season in Irma was that any one of the storms in 2004, the, the impacts, the power outages were on one part of the county or the other. Irma was countywide. Mm -hmm. Initially we had somewhere around 80% of the county without power. Wow. And that, in, that included the east part of the county, western part of the county, really everywhere. Mm -hmm. So your plan should be for your home or business is if I don't have electricity at home, which may mean you may also not have water, what am I going to do? How am I going to you know, feed my family? How am I going to bathe? I should have water for drinking. The recommendation is one gallon per person per day. Mm -hmm. But power outages, we had a, um, a lot of those people had generators. You need to understand that generators, uh, while they're, it's important you know, to power your phone, to get information, so a few lights, maybe run your refrigerator if your generator is big enough, you have to do it safely. Unfortunately, we, we did have injuries and a fatality from people running generators that were not uh, outside, you know, they were inside and uh, where the exhaust fumes are dangerous. Mm -hmm. So if you have a generator, you need to know where to put it, you know, how to operate it safely, how to add gas safely, because you don't want those to cause more injuries or unfortunately fatalities. Right. Well, Paul, thank you very much for joining us. This is great information. And here we go again. So just in time for it to be really useful. Right. Thank, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Visit the Polk County Emergency Management website. Click on the Disaster Preparedness tab, and you'll find links for the Emergency Shelters page, a three-day survival kit list, and other really helpful hurricane preparedness links. Thank you for joining us and stay safe this hurricane season. See on page four that the projections need to be blood next Thursday? Seriously? Thursday? Can't do that. Uh-uh. This is really inconvenient. I have yoga that day. I have no time for this. So I can't do Thursday, but I can do Friday. Disasters don't plan ahead. You can. Talk to your loved ones about how you're going to be ready in an emergency. Don't wait. Communicate. Being prepared is a part of who you are. But it's especially important in the case of a disaster. Be informed about possible emergencies in your area. Make a plan that covers where you'll go in an emergency. Build a kit with the things you need to survive. There's no one more capable of planning for your situation than you. Start your plan today. Go to ready.gov slash my plan. It's a beautiful day out here. Sunny today with light breezes, giving way to clouds in the afternoon. We could see some light precipitation to moderate precipitation later on, followed by powerful storm-like conditions. 90 miles per hour winds are expected. Authorities are asking everyone, stay indoors. Come on, that's it, let's go. Don't wait. Communicate. Make your emergency plan today.